I used to have a different name for the book. Okay, Jack Canfield wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He yeah. sold 500 million books. 500 million. How many people are in Canada and the U.S. combined? Okay, there's not 500 million. Okay, and he sold 500 million books. And he was telling me. And he was telling me. He got mad at me. He said, "I got so pissed off at you." I said, "Why?" He said, "I was like looking at different books, and I picked up your book and started looking at it, and I couldn't put the damn thing down." I said, "Your book is so easy to read." I'm like. I apologize. I'm so sorry. Can I use that as a testimonial? Is that the, said, is that this book? This book, but yeah, it yeah. was I had a different name for it. Okay. Okay. And the name of my book was "Sell More with a Right Brain Marketing Strategy," which is logical. Yeah. But the book is teaching people how to do emotional selling, and he said, "You know, you're teaching us emotional selling, and you have a logical title for your book. Your whole book is about brain glue. I'll give you all the quotes you want." You can record the quotes and everything on one condition. You have to change the name of your book to Brain Glue, you know? And I was like, okay. Hello, I'm John Brink, and we are podcasting on the brink from Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those guests around the world, uh, British Columbia, beautiful province, big, big province. Uh, uh, we are right in the center of British Columbia, about 500 miles or 800 kilometers north of Vancouver. And then it takes another 500 miles, 800 kilometers to the Yukon border. And so that is the length from north to south. East to west is about the same in size. So it's a big province. Today we have a special guest. Uh, his name is James Bond. Steered but not shaken. Or is it just the other way around? Anyway, James, welcome to the show. Oh, John, thank you for having me. So you have quite a resume and uh, obviously you have done a lot in marketing. Uh, you are an author and you got quite a story. Uh, so where are you from originally and then where do you live now? Well, I'm originally from Montreal uh, and I'm old. <laughs> so we named our middle daughter we gave her the initials L.A., Lauren Asia, so that we'd remember how long we've been living in Southern California. So she's 37, so we've been here for 37 years. Right. But, uh, yeah, in fact, I call people, I call friends from Montreal or Vancouver, and I say, oh, yeah, it's a miserable 70 degrees, and they just say, shut up. Of course, oh, you're... Oh, my God. <laughs> what is it now? 70? It's about 70 degrees. <laughs> yeah, 70 degrees. Where are you in California? I'm in Southern California, between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. There's a place called A Thousand Oaks, and that's where we are. Right. Beautiful here, actually. It's yeah. It's nice because it's not in you know in the, the the deepest part of the town, which is good. We get lots of space. We have beautiful mountains and birds and just the wildlife here. It's wonderful. I actually had a um, uh, a bobcat walking through my backyard a few weeks ago. I was wow. looking out the window and I was like, whoa, what's that? Yeah. So you have some wildlife there. Not quite like us, though. We have no. uh, moose, deer, black bears, grizzly bears, all the wolves and uh, foxes and all of that. The, so I just turned 83 last week. I was born in 1940. And, uh, you know, and uh, I am originally from Holland. I was born in Holland, November the 1st, 1940, in the northeastern part of Holland. And then came mm. to Canada in July of 1965, directly to British Columbia. So, wow, so I'm a kid. I'm only 71. <laughs> you could be my son. You're not quite. But, uh, you're <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite. You gave so, birth at 10. <laughs> yeah. So... So tell us a, um, a bit more about yourself, uh, James, in terms of, so you were born in Montreal. Now, you speak fluent Fr fluently French. Well, fluent, Can't, no. <laughs> I, but, it's funny because I was putting myself through school and uh, I worked as a waiter and my French was so bad that I actually made great tips oh, <laughs> because people would laugh at how I spoke French and they would call them over. Hey, hey, listen to this. Talk to me in French. And I was just, I guess I was so bad, but they thought I was friendly. And so they yeah. would always give me nice big tips, even though 
they laughed at how I spoke French. So what can for, I say? For our guests from all around the world, is uh, Canada is an interesting place. It's a mosaic of many, many different people from many, many different locations, which makes it so unique. Uh, it has two official languages. The one is English and then the other one is French. And it's Quebec French, not uh, Canada French, not quite the same as French French, but it's very close. Right. You know, yeah, so, for sure. So you were and there that, till when, uh, James? Well, just by the way, the, so I learned, I, I started in mechanical engineering. Okay. And, uh, but I left school to start an advertising agency. And when we talk about Montreal particularly, Montreal has people from Britain who would come here, artists, people from France who would come here, and then people from America. And so uh, when I was starting in advertising, uh, we had a lot of people that we would actually, we would have some of the top artists in Europe, in uh, mostly uh, Britain and France, uh, come over here because they would make more money here in America than in Britain. Britain was going through a, a, a tough time, or Europe was going through a tough time back then. And then we would do work for America. Right. So, you know, because it, we're cheaper, and they figured it's cheaper dollars, and you'd get the highest, the, the greatest talent in the world sometimes. Exactly. And that was really great. So, and so yeah, when you talk about the mix of cultures, it was very always very interesting. And But French-Canadian... The way they speak French is very different from the way French in France speak it. And often I think there were snobs in France that they would talk about Canadians as, you know, French Canadians as, you know, you're, you're not as high class because of how you speak French. It's like, you know, the language, I guess. But, but yeah, yeah it's, it, was, it was fascinating. It was very, I was very lucky to have grown up with all the mix of cultures. A little bit of American, a little bit of British, a little bit of uh, French. And there's art and science and math and you know and and then and, and business so it was fun yeah the interesting part is that uh, when i came here in 1965 they celebrated the what was it now the 100th year uh celebration or 150 year celebration of canada and uh, it was a big celebration and uh, obviously coming from holland that goes back several hundred of years and then the other part that I find so unique about North America, in particular Canada, but also the U.S. to a certain extent, it's a mosaic of so many different cultures, many people from different places, and uh, you know it makes it a very, very interesting country, Canada. And then by contrast, and I don't want to talk too much about that, but the politics in the United States much more complicated than Canada because in Canada we got the British system, the parliamentary system, and we got Trudeau and no, nobody, with all due respect, nobody really cares. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, the premier of, uh, of the, uh, or the, the premier of the, uh, Canada, uh, you know, compared to the president of the United States or other places. Uh, so our political system is also that, uh, each province had their own government under the umbrella of the uh, Canadian government, obviously. But uh, it makes it very, very interesting. But what I always found is that uh, people from all over the world came to Canada. And, and again, now we see people coming from Eastern Europe and other places. Uh, you know, it is ever changing and that in particular makes it very interesting. And in all the time that I've been here, nearly 60 years, nobody ever asked me, okay, what do you do? What is your politics or what is your religion or what is all those kind of things? Everybody is accepted for what they are, more or less. And that is not always the same in Europe. It's a bit more right. complicated, even in Holland, you know, for that matter, you know. Well, there are a lot of. I always remember Arnold Schwarzenegger saying he came, I guess, from um, Austria. Austria, Austria, right? And uh, he said that uh, his father, I think it was a mailman or something. Yes. And uh, because of that, he said he could never rise up to the top as far as class is concerned. But when he came to America, he became a movie star, an international movie star, because America allows and Canada the same, but allows 
that you know we don't, we're not so governed by the different classes. I mean, we always are to a degree, but not so much. Yeah, not here either. Uh, Canada, you know, obviously, and maybe uh, you know that I remember in Holland, my it was interesting because everybody goes through the ups and downs. My dad's side, uh, uh, his parents were farmers, or they worked for a farmer. They were not farmers. They had no land, but they were just what they called uh, workers only. And, uh, you know, and, and that would leave you in a certain grouping where if you were above that, you would not necessarily mix with the others. It is still that way to a certain extent, but not as bad as it was when I was there. You know, so, uh, but here, when I came to Canada, made no difference. And I think well, that- I, I think we have, we have such advantages. I started an advertising agency in Montreal and became massively successful. I mean, we built clients like Kraft Foods, Timex Watches, Avon Cosmetics, Abbott Laboratories, Seagram's, their world headquarters is in Montreal. Correct. Or was in Montreal, I think it still is. And so we were able to work, you know, it's funny because we feel American to a degree, you know, a lot of TV and all that stuff and movies and everything else. We're almost like the 51st state, Canada. Yeah. You know, but exactly. by the same token, we also have advantages because I think our level of education was very high. Uh, our, you know, we had uh, certain things. We have the culture that comes from Europe. We feel we recognize that we're kind of American, but we're also kind of European. Exactly. And because of that, it, it sort of raises our level of, uh, you know, I guess our self expectation. You know, yeah. we know. Um, and and, and it, so I moved to California uh, 37 years ago. And one of the things that I that always stood out of my mind is there are more people in California than there are in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And as a marketer, that was like, wow, you know, I mean, you know, we have billionaires in California and Canada. You've got to, we had to fight harder to be successful because we have such, you know, we're smaller, we're our cities. We have, you know, good sized cities, but they're far apart. Exactly. You know, you go to the Northeast of America or even the West here where I am. And I mean, yeah, you've got like billionaires that are just uh, successful in California. They don't even go outside of California. Exactly. In fact, uh, um, I remember Sam Walton, uh, who started Walmart. He turned it into the largest comp uh, one of the largest companies in the world. Now it's largest, but and sort of one of the largest countries in the world. Uh, sorry, companies in the world without even going to the major cities. Exactly. You know, I mean that's how big America is. I remember, you know, we'd go for like uh, you know drugs or something to a drugstore in Canada. Here we move down to Southern California. We've got like three drugstores that are like two next to each other and one across the street. I'm yeah. like, wow. I mean, <laughs> this is amazing. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing. Right. Now, the other thing that you were involved in marketing already, you got trained as an engineer, mechanical engineer, I believe you said. Yes. And how, how did you, then you changed direction altogether and bond heavily into marketing. How did that all happen? Well, I, so my dad had a business. He was an entrepreneur and was very successful in business. And I was always, um, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest of four kids, boy, girl, boy, boy. So I was the first boy. And uh, he, we would work with our dad a little bit in his business, but we would be in the back room. You know, we, he never talked to me about, or us about business and what it's like being in business and strategize and things like that. So I was fascinated by business. You know, how do you create a business? How does a business yeah. become successful, etc.? And so first, um, when I was put, I put myself through school. And uh, as I was putting myself through school, I apprenticed as a photographer for major, uh, some of the world's top photographers, actually, most people don't know them, but in advertising, they would know them. And I apprenticed with some of the world's top photographers. And so first I studied photography, but then I realized that advertising is the boss of photography. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, not to try to be boss, but I, so I can understand how to be better with advertising, how it works visually, et cetera. Then I would learn that marketing is the boss of advertising and everything. Exactly. And marketing deals with, you know, all aspects of like, if I invent something, 
well, how can I invent something first? But if I invent something, how do I get it to the customer and all that stuff and exactly. service them? And so I, as I learned marketing, I became fascinated by that. And so after, you know, after school, I, because I had apprenticed as a photographer, I started a photography business and then eventually started an advertising business. I actually had J. Walter Thompson had had Kraft Foods, uh, the, uh, the head of uh, um, uh, advertising and, and uh, J. Walter Thompson sent me to Kraft and said, don't tell him you're a photographer. And I said, what? They said, don't tell him you're a photographer. We want you to do like point of purchase advertising, you know, like in-store advertising for Kraft Foods. And we don't really want to do it because everybody in, in, at uh, J. Walter Thompson wants to do, uh, you know, TV advertising and, and full page advertising and stuff like that. And it's the in-store stuff, you know, we're not really crazy about it. So just tell them if I can ask them what they want you to do and tell them if I can solve your problem, would you give me the contract? And he said, I'll tell you how to price it and everything. And I said, okay. It just sort of seems strange. This is like we live in a box, you know. Yeah, My yeah. box was I was a photographer. And yeah, he said, yeah. you're not a photographer because yeah. you know so much about advertising and marketing. You go in there and then you uh, explain to them, you know, if I could solve your problem, would you give me the contract? And I yeah. went in. And then he said how much I would charge. I said, like, really? So, you know, charge like $60,000 for the work that you're going to do. I said, really? That's yeah. like way more than I would, you know, charge normally. I was like, that's not, yeah, back then, you know, I was, you know, today it's, you know, 60000 is probably about $200,000 today. Exactly. And I went in and I did it. And he, they said, yes, they gave me the contract. I did the, the photography and ads. So we created the ads. They printed them. They paid for that. And it was a blockbuster of success. And so from based on that, I, I started to realize, well, I can actually go out there and instead of begging uh, art studios and advertisers, advertising agencies for work, I can actually go directly to the client. And he actually said to me, when you do that, instead of you're coming and trying to get us to give you work, we'll start trying, you know, all the uh, advertising companies will start trying to give, get you to give them work. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It, it, first, it, it blew my mind, you know, yeah. but it made me realize, huh, you mean I can be a boss instead of an employee? You know, I mean, I was an independent but you know, when you're independent, you still feel like an employee because you're you're begging basically people for work and showing them samples. But all but that so, hap yeah. all that happened is there you had your model all designed, and then somebody said no, because you need to do the marketing and advertisement. So that's not your model. Forget about that model. It's just a piece of the other ones. And so right. now all of a sudden it became this, and now you're the boss. Yeah, exactly. It and was they great. call they calling you. <laughs> and and it was fun because I knew so much about advertising and marketing because I mm -hmm. I mean I, I was devoted to it because I wanted to do a good job for the the clients that I was working with, but I learned so much about it that I and I was so fascinated by it by eventually people realized that I actually seemed to know a lot more than the clients I was working with. Sure. And that's why it was more fun to work with with clients. Right. And so yeah, it was just, I remember going to Seagram's, okay? So this sort of goes to the brain glue thing, but um, I realized, you know, in the beginning I would try to, I felt like a car salesman, not that car salesmen are bad, but I felt like I would show all my work and try to tell them how great I was and everything else, you know, and that was not fun. But one of my brothers, my youngest brother sat me down and said, well, what are some of the questions you would ask and that when you're trying to get them as a client? And I came up with, uh, I call it before, during, and after. So the before one is, have you ever worked with an advertising agency before? If they said yes or no, it doesn't matter. But I would say, what's worked for you and what didn't work for you? Then I would say, are you, that's past. Present is, are you working with one an advertising agency right now? And it doesn't matter if they say yes or no. I would say, what's working for you? What's not working for you? And then I would do past, present, future. I would do future. And I would say, if you had the ideal situation with an advertising agency, what would that look like? What would you exactly. want? And they would basically explain it. So the first client I went into and actually tried this was Seagram's. Yeah. And uh, now I, for I our, remember going... For, for our guests around the world, Seagram is a large company focused on liquor or... or booze. Yeah. Booze. And I'm not a drinker, so no, I, but won, it, I won liquor. It's a big company. Uh, yeah. And and uh, this is just not a small little company. This is a big entity. 
Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry, I had to interrupt you there. So no, no, ahead, that's yes. yeah. good. Yeah. But yeah, they're a booze company, which is funny because, huh, you know, so I'm not a big drinker, and we would win like you know we, if we do a you know some advertising for them, we'd have like 50 bottles of booze of different types, and uh, they would say, okay, bye, enjoy your 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 holiday. You can have them for Christmas. You can have all the bottles, and I'm like, but I don't drink. You know, you yeah, a lot yeah. of friends. Yeah. But what happened was I remember going in to the uh, the, uh, one of the senior managers from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the company uh, from Seagrams, and uh, instead of normally, I would show them my portfolio, and you know, I'd show them like fifty or sixty different uh, campaigns that we had, and hopefully something would stick. But what I learned was by asking the questions, it suddenly becomes a lot easier. So I would ask uh, the buyer from uh, Seagrams you know, in the past, present, future, like if you ever work with an agency before, and, and I know they work with big comp agencies that handle everything, but there are small parts of the company that would use agencies like mine. And he said, uh, yes. And I said, well, what worked for you? and What didn't work for you? And he said right up front, the biggest problem we have is we spend 50000 to $100,000 for labels and bottles because the ba label and the bottle has to have a personality of its own. And uh, we have a lot of trouble when we work with agencies and they don't understand the importance of the bottle and a label that we spent so much money on it. And as he was saying that, I realized, wait a second, we had done uh, catalogs for a lamp, lamp manufacturer that had like about, you know, 800 different types of lamps and some are chandeliers and other, other types of lamps and lights. And so I said, well, let me show you what we did with this company. Here's a company, here's a chandelier. And we understood how the, the texture of the glass has to stand out, et cetera. And here's what we did and everything. And in the olden days, I would have had to show him all my different samples and hope that something stuck. In this case, I showed him two samples. And you know what he said to me? He said, oh, I wish I had knew, known you guys earlier. I definitely want to work with you guys. I trust you because you understand the importance of glass and labels exactly. and how to make it stand out. And so he basically told me how to sell him. And because of that, it became really easy. I went like, wow, this was, I walked out and I was like, I almost felt like, should I show him more of my work? I only showed him two things that he already hired me, but I didn't ask him for more. You know, they always say, you know, when somebody says they want to, they're okay, they're going to buy, leave. It's, you know, take their check or whatever it is. Now your younger brother, What's his name? Howard. Howard. Did you hire Howard in your advertising company because he said to you, listen, James, ask him this, ask him that, ask him that. And I would have said, hmm, I need him in my company. This guy got good, good ideas. Well, family and business doesn't always mix. No, I he had a good idea, but he was doing something else. That I was no, I'm just, was I'm just joking. Yeah. No, well, but I did work with my middle brother. Okay, I have two okay. brothers, and uh, my middle brother is a br is brilliant in marketing and brilliant in selling, but his family and business doesn't always mix. So I was no. with him for a few years, and then we separated. Yeah. But we went into Avon, Avon Cosmetics. Yeah. I always remember this, and this was profound. Johnny, my brother, was just, he's, he's fabulous. He runs a tech company now in Montreal. And uh, the buyer from Avon, we sat down with him, and the buyer for Avon leaned across the desk and said to my brother and me, hey, John, uh, it's between you and another company that we're going to give you this contract. And frankly, I'd much rather work with you, but your price is higher than the other guy. And so my brother, with the, the brilliance that he has, he said, why do you think the other guy is so cheap? There's a long pause, and then the guy said, like straight out of the textbook, okay, I get your point. All right, let me write you up a purchase order. Yeah. And I thought my head was going to explode. What happened? We yeah. didn't have to lower our price? He's actually so, working with us because our price is higher? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is like a lot of teaching me that I, there's so much about selling and persuasion. I don't know anything about that. This is exactly. early in my days. Exactly. But I became fascinated by this. Yeah. Like they hired us because our price was higher. Yeah, and and that stuck with you. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. absolutely. And so later on, uh, so you know, we did lots of work for major these major companies, and I worked uh, and I had an opportunity to win the anti drug campaign in America. And I'm a, log I'm a logical person, so we have powerful logical reasons why you should not do drugs. Exactly. But then I saw the ad that beat us, and it terrified me. And it was 
uh, a guy holding an egg saying, this is your brain. And cracking the shell and dropping the egg into a sizzling frying pan with exaggerated sizzling sound and saying, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? And when I saw the ad, it scared me because this was emotional selling, something I knew nothing. I didn't know how to do emotional selling. But I also recognized that this was infinitely more powerful than anything I could come up with. Yeah. It scared me. And so I was wondering, like, you know, they don't teach emotional selling in school. You know, I checked in the libraries, but there, there was no, they superficially touch on it, but they don't really touch on how to develop emotional selling. And emotional selling isn't just with advertising, it's, you know, trying to get people to accept our ideas is emotional selling. But so I, I, I wrote your brain on drugs on a three by five card so I would remember it. And then I decided I would create a passion box where next to my computer, I would put a box. And every time I saw an ad or heard something that was emotionally powerful, not logical, but emotionally powerful, instead of trying to overanalyze it because I didn't really understand what it is, I would put them in my box in the hopes that eventually uh, there'd be enough examples in there that I could, you know, I could learn how emotional selling works. Right. I remember I went to uh, my wife hated going to doctor's offices with me because I would go, you know, in doctor's office, you get magazines you don't normally read. Here's a Vogue magazine. I'm not, yeah. I don't subscribe to Vogue. And I'm looking through the magazine. I go, oh, wow. And my wife said, do not tear it out of the magazine. I said, no, no, look at this ad. This is amazing. I have to, I have to tear it out. And Take she the whole magazine. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, she would go like, I do not know that guy. You know, I was tearing magazines, yeah. tearing plays of the magazines. But after about 10 years, we had moved to California Southern California. And uh, I met John Gray, who's an author, and he wrote a book called Men, Women and Relationships. Okay. Fabulous book. One of the best relationship books ever written. But he was telling me how he was frustrated because it only sold a few thousand copies. People who read the book loved it, but very few people bought the book. And so he got this crazy idea. What if I change the title of the book to Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? And then tweak the content a little bit so it's consistent with the book, you know, so it refers to it. But it's basically the same book. You know, he was telling me, you know what happened? Almost overnight, half a million books got sold, then a million, then two million, then five million. In my book, Brain Glue, I talk about how he sold 10 million copies of the book. But I know John Gray, who helped him with marketing, and John Gray said, no, you're wrong. I said, well, I did my research. He said, no, no, no. We're already over 50 million books sold. 50 million books? He went from 20,000 books to 50 million books sold, all because he simply changed the title? Wow. And I was, I thought my head was going to explode. It's like, you know, so I wrote Men Are From Mars on a 3 by 5 card, and I suddenly realized that's a metaphor. Men are not really from a different planet. Some people think we are, but, you know, in general, we're not from a different planet. Right. But when I got home, I took, I said, is, is metaphors the secret to emotional selling, you know, because I realized this is your brain on drugs with an egg. That's right. a metaphor also because it's right. not a, a brain, it's an egg. But so I dumped the passion box on my bed and I quickly discovered that metaphors is one of 14 brain triggers at the heart of emotional selling. And I was like, wow, I thought my head was going to explode. You mean when we can apply these, suddenly people want to buy our products uh, or our services or our ideas? And I remember things like, we remember this in Canada, we were right up the street from, uh, from uh, America, and they were talking about, they had O.J. Simpson off. Uh, O.J. Simpson was, you know, a, 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 um, he was in on trial for uh, murdering his wife and her, her boyfriend. Correct. And they used the phrase, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Correct. That's rhyme. And so I remember after the trial, uh, a journalist was asking two of the uh, jurors, um, with all that evidence against OJ, why did you find him not guilty? And one responded while well, the other one was nodding her head in agreement. And she said, well, we knew if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. The yeah. glove didn't fit, so we had to acquit. Yeah. The power of rhyme. And rhyme is like one of the brain triggers, one of the uh, brain triggers that that resonates. So when you, So another attorney might have said, Hey, if the glove doesn't fit my client, because he had they had a glove from 
the um, that they believe belongs yeah. to the murderer. And OJ exaggerated how the glove didn't fit him. Well, and so they, they the, said, the, "Sorry, go ahead." The prosecution should have never used the glove if they didn't know it would fit. <laughs> you know? So well, that's the first thing. But the second thing is the rhyme, the phrase. Yeah, because. We I mean, have this evidence and this evidence and all this evidence, okay? I watched it. And the, yet, a glove don't fit, you must acquit. Yeah. That's stuck in the brain. And so they Perfect. looked at all that and they remembered this piece in her Perfect. brain. Perfect. Perfect. Powerful. But Unbelievable. It, it works. You know, if, if uh, you know, it, it takes a licking but keeps on ticking. I'm old enough to remember the Timex watches, okay? Yeah. I mean, they love rhyme. Uh, there's, there's a famous phrase that says, um, um, when the the whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. <laughs> okay, and so here's how that works. That. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, this is in the early day, the early 20th century. So a Wonder Bread invented sliced bread. Okay, right. yeah, yeah. And Wonder Bread bleaches their bread, so it's all white. And so what happened is, for 10 years, Wonder Bread dominated the bread industry because they invented sliced bread. There's an often there's a people say the phrase, hey, you know, that's the smartest thing since sliced bread. They don't exactly. realize it, but they're actually referring to Wonder Bread because they invented sliced bread. Exactly. But um, there was we had COVID back in their days. They had uh, something called pellagra, which is uh, when you have the, your body has the absence of vitamin B3, you actually can get sick and die just like COVID. OK, yeah. Yeah. And so what happened was they recognized that because um, Wonder Bread bleached their bread, they killed all the nutrients inside the bread. And so the competitors to Wonder Bread, after 10 years of, of Wonder Bread dominating the marketplace, they came up with the phrase that they told the journalists, hey, remember, the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. And they said, what? I said, yeah, white <laughs> bread has no vitamin B3 and you get pellagra and you die. And they published it in all the major newspapers and magazines. Dead at the end of that. Bankrupted. <laughs> But they yeah. almost went bankrupt, Wonder Bread. Wow. And the, but they invented, um, when they put uh, vitamins and minerals uh, in, in uh, bread, they put the uh, niacin, which has lots of vitamin B3 and other, other uh, not um, healthy vitamins and minerals inside it. And they actually invented that process. If they had not invented that process, they would have gone bankrupt. And the reason was because the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead, caused almost everyone who ate Wonder Bread to stop eating Wonder Bread. You know, and it's, and it's power of a, a rhyme. Yeah. But there's, you know, this lady uh, in uh, a woman, a mommy in uh, Utah uh, invented a product while she was sitting on the toilet. OK. OK. And the product she invented was a toilet stool that she recognized that when you're sitting on a toilet, if you raise your you have to raise your feet about six inches so that it's easier for your body to go to the bathroom. OK. I don't want right. to go too much into this. Right. And uh, she, I'll tell you, let me tell you the ending and I'll come back to what she did. Okay. She had, she and her son had no business experience. And in less than two years, she generated a hundred million dollars of sales. So how did she do it? The name of her product. So she's sitting on, she, when she realizes this product that is a little stool that you sit on in the, on the toilet, when you're on the toilet, she's thinking, so what do we call it? We could call it the toilet stool, but people aren't going to like that. My wife said she should call it the stool stool, but that doesn't really work. Okay. But she's thinking, okay, toilet. Toilet is not a very good name for a product, a toilet stool. But what are some other words that's, that, that say toilet? And she went potty. A lot of people call a toilet a potty. Yeah. And you're kind of, the way you're sitting here, you're almost squatting. Why yeah. don't I call it squatty potty? Rhyme, squatty potty. OK, and sales exploded. People would buy the product like crazy. Uh, it's because she used rhyme, Squatty Potty. And so Squatty Potty is like one of the power tools of Brain Glue, where, you know, if her to if her product was called the, the toilet stool, would as many people have bought it as a Squatty no. Potty? Absolutely no. not. No. Absolutely not. But also the, in, in the industrial side, there's the Porta Potty. The porta potty uses something called uh, alliteration, the repetition of sound. Porta potty, okay. And I remember I was driving underneath a tunnel with my uh, one of my grandsons, who's like six years old, and I said, "Oh, look at that!" And he says, "Oh yeah, look at the porta potty." At six years old, he knew it was a porta potty. Yeah. I know they have competitors, but and yet 
porta potty dominates the marketplace because the name porta potty. And so when people understand the power of, you know, these types of tools, the brain tools, yeah, uh, and use them to try to sell their product or idea, you know, there it blows their minds where they realize, well, this is a much easier way to get people to want to buy our product or or idea. You know, I mean, it's just really powerful. So just that that applies yeah. right across the board, really, doesn't it? It doesn't matter if it's uh, saying. What makes Facebook so popular? Well, is Facebook it, understands the interactivity. Facebook is a very strong interactivity one. Right. But people post things. Let me give you an example of some a woman who. Uh, so a lot of people in marketing try to spend. They spend money on social media advertising, mostly right. Facebook advertising. Okay. Well, here's a woman. She's a stay-at-home mom. Who, who has over 5 million fans, okay, which is more than most of us, okay, 5 million fans. You know what she spent on advertising? Nothing. Zero. Yeah. So how does, she spend, how does she spend zero and get 5 million fans on Facebook? Well, here's what she did. She created a page, and then she wanted to come up with a name for the page. And so she's a stay-at-home mom. So she was thinking, I could call my, my page Mommy Needs, let's see, Mommy Needs Time to Herself. Mommy needs rest, uh, you know. Oh, I know what mommy needs. Mommy needs vodka. She called her page Mommy Needs Vodka, and she got 5 million fans. So how did she get 5 million fans? I, I must have a friend. I'm a fan, okay? I must have a friend who was a fan of the 5 million fans. And so I saw a post on my Facebook page, and it was a fun post. But then I noticed it's from Mommy Needs Vodka? What the heck's that? I clicked on that as most people do, came to her page, saw all these positive posts. They were really fun. I said, oh, I got to be a, I got to be a fan. And I clicked on that. And so, you know, she became a, you know, most of us became fans because we saw one of her posts somewhere. We saw it's from mommy needs vodka. We clicked on it and made us go to her page and then we could see, you know, the post. And there are a lot of people that have really good posts but they don't have 5 million fans. And the reason is because they don't have a name that resonates so much. And so, yeah, this is powerful. So, so it comes down to the name. Now, if I look behind you, I see Brain Clue. That's the book that you wrote, right? Yes. So uh, it's actually, it, I used to have a different name for the book, okay? Jack Canfield wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He yeah. sold 500 million books, 500 million. How many people are in Canada and the U.S. combined? Okay, there's not 500 million, okay? And he sold 500 million books. And he was telling me, and he was telling me, he got mad at me. He said, I got so pissed off at you. I said, why? He said, I was like looking at different books, and I picked up your book and started looking at it, and I couldn't put the damn thing down. Oh. I said, your book is so easy to read. I'm like, I apologize. I'm so sorry. Can I use that as a testimonial? Is that, the, said, is that this book? This book, but yeah, it was, yeah. I had a different name for it, okay? Okay. And the name of my book was Sell More with a Right Brain Marketing Strategy, which is logical. Yeah. But the book is teaching people how to do emotional selling. And he said, you know, you're teaching us emotional selling and you have a logical title for your book. Your whole book is about brain glue. I'll give you all the quotes you want. You can record the quotes and everything on one condition. You have to change the name of your book to brain glue, you know? And I was like, okay. You know, Jack Canfield, you know, he's a wealthy, wealthy person. And what happened uh, to your book after that? It took off like crazy. It yeah. took off like crazy. And the reason is because, yeah, it's, you know, my name is James I. Bond. So people right. look for me on, on, on Amazon. You can't find me because you find Sean Connery and all the other James Bonds, okay? Right. That's the first thing. But they couldn't remember the name of my book because it was logical sell more with the right brain marketing strategy, but nobody right. could remember the name. Right. Brain glue, they could remember the name, but also yeah. it resonates. You know, yeah. sell more with the right brain marketing strategy doesn't resonate like brain glue resonates. And so when it resonated with people, suddenly they went like, yeah, you, you know, I, I, you know, what's brain glue? That sounds interesting. And they would, you know, as they start to understand, and I would describe, if I would describe it to people, you know, I would say it's when things, certain things stick to the brain. That's why I call it brain glue. And they would go, oh, very interesting. Okay, work with me on this one then. I'm writing a book about a very interesting life that goes through all the ups and downs and 
and show success and all the other things, what do I name it? So now, I, named it, I named it already something. I just want okay. to see if you can relate to it. This one. Okay, that's awesome. So, against all odds. Yep, against all odds. That's a really good title, actually. That's a really Is good it? title. Yeah? Yeah, it's a really good title. I'm going to send you a, um, cop a copy of this one. Oh, I appreciate that. No, and, that and looks really for you good. to critique. But then the other thing that I have to tell you, then I want to write another book. Uh -huh. and, and now then I found out by pure coincidence when I was already 57 years old, and I was not very good in school. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. And I thought I was a failure. And so that Einstein I, failed grade seven also, you know that? Unbelievable. <laughs> I thought I always was the first one. <laughs> you know, no. so anyway, then I wanted to a store here and I f felt for all that time, I, I built companies and did all the other kinds of things. I felt I had failed because all my friends that went to school with me went to college and to university and, and I was a laborer. I started working with my hands when I was 14. And then I felt I had to start all over again. And, uh, you know, we were liberated by the Canadians, April the 12th, 1945. And it made such an impression on me that I always knew I would go to the lands of my heroes. And then uh, the other part, uh, uh, you know, it will all connect here in a minute, is that my dad worked in a lumber company and I wanted to build a lumber mill. And that's why I went to British Columbia. And that's why I'm in Prince George. And I did build a lumber mill. So then I went into the store here when I was 57. I picked up a book and I looked at the book and it said, the book's title was Driven to Distraction. And it said ADHD. And I said, oh my God, now I know who I am. And I wrote in Dutch in my book because I was ashamed of it. I thought it was a mental disorder. And I wrote in my book, now I finally know who I am. Obviously, more and more people have become aware of ADHD. I call it a superpower. And so I speak on the topic. I'm also a professional speaker. I uh, did uh, communication to you, very important, is that I was not a very good communicator. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of pieces here, but you can handle them. Is that somebody talked me in to go to Toastmasters, and I did that. I, I said, I, okay, I'll go. but do they do that? I said, I was not very, I could talk to about three people at the same time in my own setting, otherwise I couldn't. And, right. and they, they said, go to Toastmasters with me. I said, okay, are they gonna ask me anything? They said, no. So I was sitting in Toastmasters the first time that I went down there. And then during the middle of the meeting, they said, hey, John, tell us a little bit about you. I said, oh my God, I'll never go back here. <laughs> so I did go back. I stayed there for 10 years. I became a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest level of Toastmasters. And I'm yeah. also an in-demand uh, uh, professional speaker and those kind of things. So coming back to ADHD, I felt I have an obligation to be more vocal about it, speak on the issues, speak on the topics and help people understanding at least what I think about it. And so I wrote a book about ADHD. See if you connect to it. ADHD unlocked. Oh, sorry. No, it's good. That's okay. Yeah, can it's just because there's a on the screen. Can you see it? Yeah, no, it's I can see unlocked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ADHD. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous cover. Yeah, ADHD Fabulous unlocked. Cover. Uh huh. Fabulous cover. I, you know, people don't understand that you have an advantage. You know, um, Richard Branson has ADHD. There are a lot of famous exactly. people with ADHD Absolutely. because you, you have a different way you look at the world. Correct. Okay? And you have, but you have impatience also. Correct. You know, that's I, why I have a little bit of ADHD, and that's why people say they like my book because it's short and sweet. Gets to the point of, you know, I don't have patience to give you like 50 pages about a topic. In and, and out, let's explain it and move on. 
and I'm going to send three books to you. I'm going to sign them for you. I want you to Thank comment you so on me. So I did another one that I wrote as well because I'm, I'm an individual that has... Uh, oh, I have to show you another thing here. So when I came to... I, I, I had failed in Holland, I thought. And so I was going to find, prove to myself that I could do be successful as well. And so I wanted to start with absolutely nothing. So I had a suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and I, I took $150 when I left Amsterdam. Landed in Montreal, uh, you know, took the train across Canada, came to uh, uh, Vancouver. Fortunately, there was a German fellow. I could speak some German. I didn't speak English, I didn't know a soul, didn't have a job, and I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to build a lumber mill. He said, go to Prince George. That's what I did. So when I came off the bus here in Prince George, July 1965, I had $25.47. And But what I did have is attitude. I always avoid the negative. Passion is that I give everything that I got to things that I believe in and then work ethic and I work harder than anybody. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so my employees gave this to me actually. And so that became very important. And then the other part that, uh, you know, talking on titles and books is that I even now at 83, I still work probably 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And, and I usually get up at 5.30 in the morning and I always feel I'm late. So, and, and I always make my bed and, and I love the things that I do. But I always felt that a lot of people don't like their jobs much. And I heard some comments on one of the US, I was CNN or one of the other uh, 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 media companies. And so they said that in the United States, probably the same in Canada, 70% of the population do not like their jobs and that 75% of the 70% are looking for another job. And I thought that is so much so. And already last year, I wrote another book on that same topic. And I don't know if you can see that. Yep, Fi finding your passion, inside. living the dream. And I wrote... So I, I so that, hang on, I want to stop you just for a second and say, I saw a guy with a t-shirt that says, life sucks and then you die. And yeah. I'm like, no, that's crazy. <laughs> crazy. And that's crazy. This is life right now. You have to, you can enjoy anything. I mean, I worked uh, in a machine shop where I was, uh, there were a metal bending shop for a while when I was struggling. And I loved the job. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't love it because I, it was hard on me and everything else. But you know, you have passion for it, and I think people have to understand this is life right now. Exactly. This is life. And you can have pat. You're going to have passion, positive or negative. You choose. Exactly. And it doesn't matter how bad your job is, how hard your life is. You know, I mean, look at wh where we live. I mean, we live. How do you like to live in uh, Ukraine right now? I mean, come on, or or in the right or now. in the Middle East, right? Or in yeah, exactly. Korea, China, yeah, Russia. Right. Name it up, yeah, right? Exactly. Korea, uh, you know, yeah. Chile and on and on and on. You know, so I'm going to send you this too. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the... Thank you. And I'm going to sign it for you. And then, uh, you know, so... And then I'm doing one more. And that's coming out next July. And th that book title will be Living Young, Dying Old. And, and it is about quality of life. It's not the number is having that quality of life and being proactive in your health and, and, and your diet, your mental Ill, uh, uh, well-being, uh, you know, stay active physically, uh, you know, the, uh, so I go to the gym, I'm uh, even at 83, I'm still, I think I'm the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America, and, and I go to the gym and I want to go again, compete next year, I qualified for the Arnolds and for the Nationals here in Canada. And uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting everybody should do that, but at least for a half an hour a day, be active, walk, keep your body active, watch out for your diet, what you eat, and stay away. But I usually do, if uh, I do all the shopping, my wife is uh, vegan, I'm 
80-20 probably. And if I go to a grocery store, I always do the outside of the grocery store. I don't go to the middle of the grocery store. They, they haven't got anything there that I eat. All the other things, the vegetables and the fruits and all the other things on the outside. You know, so, uh, and then stay mentally healthy and active. And do you stay still have lumber now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I have three silos, actually. The one is, uh, I got uh, three different lumber mills, one in, in, in northern British Columbia. That's the one silo. The other one is, uh, I'm, I do warehousing, distribution, and uh, logistics. We are probably the largest dis uh, warehousing company in northern British Columbia. And then the other one, we do real estate, both uh, residential, commercial, and uh, uh, and industrial and uh, and then we have another half a dozen companies so I'm still very very active in my companies but then I do a lot of podcasting I do a lot of writing I do a lot of public speaking and I love it I enjoy life you know well but here so you didn't have much money when you came to Canada Nothing. how did you start your lumber mill that's a very good question I'm entrepreneurial and uh, so First, I started as a cleanup man at the lumber mill here to kind of start learning the language. Then I became a lumber pilot. Within a year, I was the superintendent of the mill. Within a year and a half, somebody noticed me and they wanted me to become a manager of a mill. And I said, okay, uh, I got an option of getting one third of the ownership if I managed the mill for five years. I stayed in the motel, I bought the motel, and then uh, I, I left there, and then, uh, you know, the, but, so I already started becoming entrepreneurial then. The, the sawmill there didn't work out, but I came back to Prince George, did a, wrote a, a, a business proposal for starting a lumber mill here that was uniquely different in some of the things that I learned in Holland. And I needed $25,000 to start the mill. And I dropped off my business plan to every single bank in town who all turned me down except two that stayed with me. And, uh, and I wanted 25000 After I was there for the 12th time, the manager said I could hear him three little uh, offices away, give them the money. I wanted $25,000 to start a mill. So I, I started with $25,000 and three employees. And today we are closer to five or 600 employees and all kinds of different companies. But uh, everything, so is, it, everything is possible. So you an entrepreneur because it was in your DNA? Correct. No doubt. Of, and AD, and AD, you know, ADHD. Right. And I noticed that with, because I do... Uh, uh, I do work with the U.S. Small Business Administration where I do like coaching and uh, workshops and, and, and seminars and webinar, webinars today, but the seminars, you know, we'll have like two, three hundred people sometimes. And I notice this, that some people have it in them, in their DNA. And some people, they start a business and you could tell these, this person should not be in business for himself. They do not understand. They don't have entrepreneurism. You don't have the spark of like, I got to make my product. Yeah. I say, so tell me. What your product is the alter? What are the alternatives to your product or service? And then why should somebody buy from you instead of somebody else? And it's amazing how many people can't answer that question. Exactly. You know, you and I understand. Like, if we create a business, you know, I better understand. Like, what are they? What are they buying? And why should they buy from me? How do exactly. I make this better so that I can have an edge, a little bit of an edge? And oh, I don't have to have this big an edge. I have to have this big an edge. But you know, then they're comfortable buying from me. Exactly. When people do that. It's suddenly just, you know, you can see the you know, see, revenue. Up. I had my lumber business for 50 years now, you know, so, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, it's the land of opportunity. So I can look around me. The key for me is right. to make sure that I don't become too big. Right sizing is always critical. And then right. d doing analysis of uh, opportunities and, uh, you know, and again, being ADHD, sometimes you have to train yourself to not become impulsive. And so, right. and, and knowing who I am, finally, it took me till I was 62 before I really found out, uh, 
I, I picked up the book when I was uh, 57. Then five years later, I went to my doc, was a friend of the family, delivered our two daughters. And I walked five years when I was 62, I walked into his office. He said, John, why are you here? I said, I think I got ADHD. And, and so we checked it out and yeah, I do big time. You know, so, and, uh, you know, so, but that to me made the difference and uh, it changed all those things for me. I started writing books. I thought about it for a long time, uh, like uh, Against All Odds. Uh, I thought about it for, tw I lived it for 80 years, thought about it for 20, and then it took me two years to write it. Writing books is not easy. No, it's not, and especially for someone who has ADHD. <laughs> yeah, and then it was grade seven, three times, uh, you know, but I am a good writer, you know, so amazingly. So that's yeah. kind of, uh, so the, I'm going to send you these books and, you know, the, uh, you. the other one that I'm going to do is Living Young, Dying Old basically means that it's quality of life that counts. I know people that are 40, 45 years old, they're done. They lay on the couch and they say, well, I'm, I'm too old for this, I'm too old for that, and I don't like this and I don't like that. I said, no, you know, that be active. You know, like even at 83, I'm going to the gym, I'm still looking at doubling the size of our companies, and I'm still very, very active. I love to go make presentations. I love doing podcasting and all of that, right? Yeah, well, and that's, I always remember George Burns, the actor. He died at 100, but he was always drinking booze. They said, oh, drinking, you know, he smoked cigars and he ate meat and everything. And he laughed, but he laughed all yeah. the time. He was always laughing. He was had a good sense of humor. He yeah. made other people laugh. And he yeah. recognized, you know, this is life right now. We have to enjoy it. Exactly. Now, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't, uh, you know, but, but everybody is own way. But... You know, they, our right. body is very precious and very forgiving, but, uh, you right. know, we should not abuse it or be creating awareness to me is very, very important, James. And so is it, uh, fortunately, my wife feels the same. And I felt I had to write that book about it, uh, you know, the different approach to health in a lot of ways, uh, you know, and uh, so that's why uh, it comes out next July. Uh, you know, living young, dying old. And uh, I want to get so to I, 120. I, I had a friend who was um, worked for a, um, a pet supplement company. And she's a dog. She raises dogs and sells them. And she, you know, she trains them and all that stuff. And uh, she went to the doctor because she was feeling sick. And the doctors mm. diagnosed her and said, you have cancer. You're probably going to live for about three months. You'll be lucky. Whoa. And she said, the hell with you. You know, she said, get your, your th he, the doctor said, get your things in order because you're going to be living for just two or three months. And she said, screw you. I want another doctor. I want a doctor that says, you know, maybe 5% of the people survive and I'm going to work with you. So you become one of those 5%. Exactly. It's the mindset. Now, I exactly. know her now. She's, it's over 10 years since the doctor told her that. And she now has no cancer. But Unbelievable. She, she said, I don't want someone who's going to be negative. I don't want a doctor who says, get rid no. of your, your life is over. I said, I want a doctor that says, you know what, you've got this disease, let's roll up our sleeves, a small percentage live, and you're going to be one of them. That's and, what you want. It's like, and, it's and, the, and the key, James, is that she was proactive in saying, that's your opinion. I don't accept that. You know, and, exactly. and, and become knowledgeable. With the internet, the way we have Google and all the other things that we have, uh, the access to health and information much broader than it was a generation ago or 10, 15 years ago, is that, uh, you know, to become more knowledgeable, uh, awareness of different approaches to medical issues that you may have and, and lifestyles in particular. A lot of it, sickness or illness or other things that happen are directly relating to either diet or exercise or the both of them. And attitude. And attitude. And no attitude. No question about that. With all these that. people right now, there's a there's growth of people who are depressed, depression, exactly. and suicides. Exactly. Especially young kids, and it's yeah. because you don't understand. You control your mind. Stop. Exactly. You know, one of my favorite books when I was young was, well, two books: Think and Grow Rich and Psycho Cybernetics. 
And Psycho Cybernetics was written by Maxwell Maltz, who was a plastic surgeon. And he would change somebody's face, and yet they look in the mirror and they said, I'm still ugly. And he realized it's not plastic surgery you need, it's the mind change that you exactly. need. You need to manage your mind. Exactly. And so and, and it helped me understand, you know, I mean, I was a little mad when I was a kid and all that stuff. And I realized that I, I don't want to be mad all my life. I want to have a, a life of happiness and, and, you know, fulfillment where I'm helping other people and like you are, okay? Exactly. And it's just, we get to control who we are. And it's sad that people are just, you know, especially younger people are so focused on depression. How can you be depressed? Look at where you live. Come on. Exactly. Do something. Make a difference to other people. Help other people. Make a difference in their lives, and it will change your life. And, and when I make presentations, especially to young people, I said, you are special. You uniquely are different from everybody else. Accept who you are, and, and you are unique, and you are precious. Do not, if, if you're going to say you are not, and this is not right, and that's not right, and all the other things, you're not going to be a happy person. You right. are uniquely special, and it is you Absolutely. that makes you happy. No one else can do it for you, but you have to accept that you're unique and that you're different, and that is very, very special. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think when we recognize, and everyone, this is a thing that most people don't understand. We all have different strengths, yeah. okay? And one of the things they make a mistake often in school is they say, well, let's strengthen your weaknesses. I say, screw that. Let's understand what your strengths are because exactly. nobody is good at everything. So there no. are certain things. If you have ADHD, I have a little bit of ADHD, okay? I, that gives me an advantage. It's not yeah. a negative, it's a positive. Yeah. It makes me, you know, I want to get to the point quicker. I want exactly. to understand, you know, I did turnarounds of businesses. It made me easier, easier for me because I would say, so, you know, people would be focused on all our procedures. Yeah. But when you're doing a turnaround, you have to back away and say, like, forget the procedures. Let's understand what are we trying to accomplish and what's the easiest way to get there? You, you see, the, it, the, the interesting part about this, James, is that I'm a distinguished Toastmaster, so I acquired the skills of... Uh, me too, so, by the way. And, yeah, and, and so... I love Toastmasters. It changed my life and... For anybody who's listening, if you don't do Toastmasters, you're crazy because it's one of the few things that where almost everybody says it changed my life. It changed my life. Now you can Mine well imagine too. when I'm in business meetings, I don't put up as very, I'm very good at business meetings. Obviously, that's part of Toastmasters. And, and then at the same time, I don't make things complicated. I say, keep it simple. I don't tolerate people getting carried away on this, that my, t my meetings are very small, very short, and very to the point. And so that's how it works. And part of that is, uh, luckily, I got, I'm blessed with uh, Toastmaster, uh, with uh, uh, ADHD, uh, what I call the superpower, in combination with uh, uh, Toastmasters, uh, you know, and that makes a, a very, very powerful combination. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's just, you know, we don't realize, you know, how important interaction is with other people. No and that's why Toastmasters are so important because it gives us, and Toastmasters, most people don't understand this. Toastmasters has two core skills it teaches us, more than that, but two core skills. How to speak, but also how to listen. And that's exactly, of, you say precisely what I always say. Don't make a mistake about Toastmasters that you think it's only about speaking. First and foremost, become a good listener, then right. also a good speaker, you know? Right, exactly, exactly. No, it's on many levels. It's so good. I also remember that you always do the sandwich. If you're going to criticize, criticize someone, don't say, that was terrible what you did. You know, if it's a speaker, you say, I love the speak, I love the topics, and I love how you speak. But you were looking at the left side of the audience, not the right. You might want to look at everybody, uh, look at both sides of the audience. But otherwise, I love your topics and I'm looking forward to it. The sandwich. And, and we do that in Toastmasters, right? We, we structure, we, as people make presentations as part of being a Toastmaster lesson, then we said, these were the strong points that I saw in your presentation. And then right. the room for improvement I would see maybe in these areas. Do the sandwich. Right. 
and it gives people encouragement and it brings them further. So uh, yeah, so they want to be because the worst thing you want is to have a relationship where people don't want to be anywhere near you. That's exactly. why, especially you're in business. I'm in business, so you know, you know, we're we want to retain people, so they want to, you know, they want to. They want to be part of what we're doing. We feel like we're all part of the team. I mean, I started the business, you started your business. So, you know, you've got some benefits, there's no question, but you don't have, you can share it. You exactly. know, you don't treat people like they're scum. You don't treat, treat, no. treat people like that. You treat people like we're all in this together. And because Respect. of that, people never want to leave. They never want to leave. Respect. That's what I exactly. always say. Mutual, I don't care if somebody is. Yeah. James. I do turnaround sometimes. This last thing. And I, uh, this guy puts, he has a, um, a value statement on the wall and I came in with masking tape and I covered it up and he said, why are you covering it up? I said, you say you want to treat people well and you're sitting and criticizing all your people. You're terrorizing them. You, I'm taking that, covering that up so that until you can change. <laughs> because, hey, if you de determine values that are important, f stick to the values. Just because you wrote it down doesn't mean that's your values. It means, you know, you've got to apply it. Application is everything. I love it, James. James, it was a pleasure, uh, you know, to have you on my podcast and uh, be sure to stay in touch. I'm going to send you these three books. I'm going to sign them for you and, uh, you and then we'll stay in touch. You know, the, we'll mark you down to. maybe six months from now or so. We'll have another uh, podcast. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And Thanks, you're Dan. awesome. I can just, I mean, the, the impact you have on your companies and the people you speak with, I mean, it's just as profound. And I think that's, you know, it's just great. Thank you, James. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. You too. Take care.